All righty, so I think most of us are here now. So I'll go ahead and start. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephanie Payo, and I am an education support specialist with Pinellas County UF IPIS Extension at the Wheaton Island Preserve Cultural and Natural History Center in St. Petersburg, Florida. I wanna say thank you all for joining us today for the program, Florida Birds Through the Seasons, where we'll be learning about the many species of birds that call Florida home and those that visit us for only a short time during their migrations. Before the program begins, I wanna ask everyone one more time to please keep your audio muted and your videos off so that we can all easily focus on and hear our presenter. If you experience any technical difficulties in controlling these AV settings, staff can adjust them for you and we may do so at our discretion during the presentation. The program will be about 45 minutes long, followed by the opportunity for a Q&A. If you think of a question that you'd like to ask our presenter, please type it into the chat and then we will present the question to him at the end of the program. Today's webinar is just one of a few that the Wheaton Island Preserve Cultural Natural History Center currently has scheduled and we will be adding more soon. So if you're interested to learn more about our online offerings, please visit us on Facebook or Instagram. Our handle is Wheaton Island Preserve, or you may also visit our website at WheatonIslandPreserve.org, and there on the homepage, you can find a list of all of our upcoming programs. Our website is also a great place to stop to find information on the preserve's hours of operation, amenities, trail maps, and the archeological and cultural history of Wheaton Island. Now for our guest today. He studied ecology and evolutionary biology at Cornell University, has conducted research on birds in Borneo and Papua New Guinea, has worked as an environmental educator, a kayak, hiking, and a snorkel guide, and he is a hobby wildlife photographer whose work we have the pleasure of seeing today. I'm very pleased to present Brian Magnier. Thanks, Stephanie. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's a bit about me. Um, I. You know, I love bird photography and pretty much all the pictures you'll see today are mine. There's one slide. Um, there's, let's see, there's a couple slides where um, I took some pictures off the internet and gave credit um, where credit is due. But yeah, most of them will be my pictures. Most of them were taken in Florida and some of them were taken right at Whedon Island. Um, so we'll get to see a lot of fun, fun birds today. So without any further ado, let's talk about some birds. Um, so some of you may be thinking, you know, Florida doesn't really have seasons. Um, not like, you know, here I'm in Oregon right now and it is cold and icy out there. Um, and so there's definitely seasons in other parts of the country, but some of the birds would actually disagree with you. There are, there are seasons in Florida. Uh, there are definitely some resident birds that are, are there all year round, like the roseate spoonbill, but then there's some that are only in Florida during migration or in the winter like some ducks, like this scop. Um, so what we're gonna talk about today is kind of the change of Florida's birds with the seasons, uh, where they go when they're not here in Florida, um, how they navigate during migration, uh, some birds that you can find during each season, a little bit about molt and how they change their feathers and their appearance and why they do that. And then some local birding hotspots just to uh, give everybody who's in Florida uh, some places to uh, to go check out if you want to look at some of the birds. So just like there are some flowers that can be seen blooming in many months, like St. John's wort, this little yellow flower, there are some birds that are resident in Florida and can be found throughout the year. The red-shouldered hawk is one of these residents, and it's one of the most commonly seen birds throughout Florida all year round. But then there are some other flowers, and indeed some other birds, that are very seasonal, only gracing us with their presence over a few months of the year. So the butterfly orchid and the swallow-tailed kite are both species that we only see in the summertime. Uh, but we don't have to take my word for it. We can look at some data. Uh, and there's no better place to look at bird-related data than eBird. Uh, eBird is this huge citizen science platform created by Cornell uh, that pools and organizes birding lists um, submitted from the general public around the world. So if you were to go outside right now, you'd find a few birds, uh, but that would be a very small subset of what's actually around. Um, oops, sorry, let me just move this out of the way. My own face is in the way of my slide. <laughs> Here we go. 
Um, so with massive amounts of information, you can start to see patterns of abundance, when and where the birds are active. Um, so here with this chart, we've got our months um, kind of going from left to right here, starting January, uh, the summer would be in the middle and then back to December. And then we've got all these different species of birds that have been reported. And this is data from all of Florida. Um, and the bigger the green block, the more checklists that bird is on. So the more commonly it is seen. And you can see that a lot of these are seen year round. So these are uh, a lot of wading birds here. We've got bitterns and herons, um, egrets, things that like fish. And fi uh, Florida has plenty of fish all year round. On the other hand, if you look at the reported data in Florida for ducks, there's not very many ducks that spend the summer here. Most of them go up north um, and then come back down to Florida in the winter because they really like having unfrozen open water to swim around on. And a lot of the ponds up north would be frozen uh, in the winter time. And so you get a lot of these ducks here only around Florida in winter and migration. And then kind of the third category of birds that frequent Florida are the migrants. And so these ones, if you look at the data, people only ever see these guys kind of April and May in spring migration when they're heading north or August, September, October when they're heading back south. And these here are the warblers. These guys like eating insects. Um, again, not very many insects up north in the winter time. So where are they all going? Uh, the eBird data kind of tells us about the relative abundance of each species in Florida, but it doesn't really say anything about where they are when they're not here in Florida. Um, luckily, the eBird people were kind enough to put together and compile a lot of data from all over the country, different counties, different states, um, and then put them together into something called a flame chart or an occurrence map, which are really, really cool. And so these things, basically, they um, map through time um, how the birds are moving throughout the country. And actually, here, I'm going to, let's see, the flame chart does not like the fact that I'm sharing part of my screen. So I think I'm going to quickly do a new share and then, Sorry, quick intermission here with a little technical fun time. Okay. Let's do this and then let's just play the whole slideshow. Okay. So here, there we go. Now this thing is moving. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see this where the what looks like this flame is moving up the country. So this is the flame chart for a tree swallow. And so what's happening is the date here is at the top. We're moving kind of through time. And what we're going to do is we're gonna move from winter through spring migration. Now we're in summer. Tree swallows are no longer in Florida in the summertime. They're up north, northern US, up in Canada. But then look, you see July and August are starting to contract. Their range is coming down south. And then once you're back into September, then we get tree swallows again in Florida. So this is kind of a cool way to visualize where these birds are moving throughout the year. So we can go, here's another, another flame chart, the palm warbler. This is one of the most abundant little birds in Florida in the winter time, but come summertime, they are gone. They just go straight out of the country all the way up into Canada to nest and then really quickly back down in migration in the fall. Then they're full, like they're filling Florida again. Um, Another one, uh, just an interesting chart, just because I love these um, designs here. The Scarlet Tanager. This is one that we rarely get in Florida. It's only really there in migration. Uh, you can see Florida gets a little bit of pale orange there, uh, just in the spring and then a little bit in the fall. But most of them kind of hop over the Gulf of Mexico and like to fly up the Mississippi River or the Appalachians. Um, and so you don't get Scarlet Tanagers for most of the year, um, but then, you can get just a little hint of them here. This is in April that you seem to get them. Okay, one more flame chart. Savannah Sparrow, again, just kind of showing where these birds are moving when. 
Uh, and you can find all of these charts online. Uh, they're really fun to just kind of look around, uh, look at and play with a little bit to see where some of your favorite backyard birds are going at different times of the year. Um, so with those gone, I'm gonna switch back real quick to this uh, other screen share right here, right there. And there we go. Okay, sorry about that. So here's a more standard range map that you'll see in things like field guides. Um, and so we've got uh, winter birds shown in blue here. These are yellow rumped warblers and they like hanging out in Florida in the winter time. But then in the summer, you know, they go all the way up into Canada. So you don't get to see any of these yellow rumped warblers um, during the summertime. And they look quite different. So here, this yellow rumped warbler on the bottom, this is what we would see in Florida in the winter. It's very brown, streaky. But then in the summertime up north, you get these bold colors. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later why um, these birds look so different one time of year rather than the other. Um, you know, another uh, range map here, the black-bellied whistling duck. This is one of the ducks that stays resident all year round. Um, and in a field guide, this is denoted by this kind of purple color here. The white pelican's kind of a fun oddity because you think of pelicans, <clears throat> excuse me, you think of pelicans as these kind of seafaring birds. You think of brown pelicans, you'd think of docks and piers. <clears throat> but the white pelican, they're here in the winter, um, but they really like these freshwater lakes. They like coastal lagoons a bit, but then in the summer, they go up into the prairies. They go into Yellowstone, up into Canada, um, North Dakota, South Dakota. And so it's kind of interesting to think you could see white pelicans in the Midwest. You know, that it seems like such a coastal bird. Um, but when you look at the range map, you can see that these pelicans are very different than the brown pelicans, which also call Florida home, but year round. So one last range map of Florida birds, the swallowtailed kite, one of my favorites. Uh, this one, it kind of shows that the swallowtailed kite really likes warm weather because it's up here in the Northern hemisphere in, the, in our summer. And then in our winter, so November, December, January, it goes all the way down past the equator into South America down here. And so it's always finding you know, the warmest weather. They like eating insects and lizards and things like that that also like warm weather. So studying migration can be pretty difficult. There's many birds to keep track of and you know, some birds don't make it. And a lot of the migration happens at night. Um, so there are these kind of different patterns where uh, birds could migrate and it's tough to know what the birds are actually doing um, without a lot of intense research. So three ways that birds could be migrating. If you have kind of a hypothetical range map, we've got some birds up in the north in the summer. In the middle, you've got birds that are there year round. And then kind of in the south here in California, you've got birds here all winter. So you could have birds staying um, in Oregon, Washington all year. And then the Canada birds fly down to California. So that'd be something called leapfrog migration. Uh, you could have something else called chain migration where the Alaska and Canada birds come to Oregon and Washington. And then the Washington and Oregon birds, they fly even farther south to California. So they just kind of shift down the coast. Or you could have telescopic migration where all of the birds that are farther north <clears throat> kind of head farther south. And these are all different ways that birds could be moving around, establishing territories, interacting with each other that are kind of interesting questions that are really difficult to study uh, without some fun tools to study migration, especially migration that's happening at night. And so here's one of the ways that now we can kind of look at migration patterns at night. Um, turns out that this scale of this migration is enormous enough that we can actually observe migration patterns using radar that's usually used for weather predictions. Uh, one of my friends at Cornell actually worked on this project. And now this project is sophisticated, sophisticated enough that you could go during migration and you could look at some weather reports and you could look at this, these charts that they publish online and you could predict kind of how many birds are gonna be migrating, what's gonna show up the next day or into the next week. Um, 
And it's just really cool to think of how much data you can get from these, you know, weather surveying that we didn't know could detect all of these birds. But here, all of the blue on this map, this isn't rain data. These are birds kind of flying by all these different radar sensors, these towers here. So I've kind of started talking about migration, but we kind of skimmed over why birds migrate in the first place. And of course, the main reason would be food. Um, Florida has a fair bit to offer year round, but up north, it's, um, it's a bit more seasonal. Uh, Alaska and Canada, for instance, are barren wastelands for songbirds most of the year. Uh, but then in the summer, they're a paradise for insectivores, uh, especially. Uh, so uh, up north, up in Alaska and Canada, you get these incredible densities of insects, especially mosquitoes, which are not super fun if you're a person. Um, but if you're a bird, like a little warbler, it's well worth flying a thousand miles to just have really long days, lots of sunlight, and tons and tons of food, more than you could ever need. Um, and so those, make, those mosquitoes make up a vital part of the food chain for countless species. Um, and so that's why a lot of birds will head north. So birds are migrating, they wanna find food, but how are they actually migrating? These are huge scales, especially for birds that are really, really small. Um, and so here are kind of the seven main ways birds uh, are known to navigate. Uh, some of them are relatively obvious, you know, things that we would use ourselves if we wanted to navigate, but then some are a little bit more fuzzy. Some, you know, things where if we don't have the senses that the birds do, it's kind of tough for us to know uh, what the birds are seeing or thinking. Uh, so the first thing is of course landmarks. Birds are known to use coastlines and mountains and lakes, things that are physical landmarks, part of the, uh, the local geography. And so they can use them to navigate. A lot of birds will hug the Mississippi River to head north. A lot of birds will hug the Appalachians or the Atlantic coast. Um, and so, you know, if they can see different landmarks, they can follow them. But what if it's maybe cloudy out? or they're over just this, you know, the middle, the Midwest, and they, everything looks the same. It's just miles and miles of agricultural fields, and it's tough to tell what direction is what. Well, then we have a geomagnetic compass. And so it's shown that a lot of birds actually have a way to detect um, true north, essentially, without needing to see anything. You can blindfold them, and they will still be able to find north on it. Um, it's shown that some of them actually seem like they have little iron or magnetic sort of flex in their bills and in their brains, um, which is just crazy. So there's some way they are actually attuned to the magnetic fields that Earth has. Uh, the next thing that birds use to navigate during migration is the sun position. Uh, so of course, you know, the sun rises in the east, sets in the west. Um, the birds are kind of, you know, on an, kind of an innate scale uh, they are aware of where the sun is supposed to rise and set, and so they can figure out which way is north uh, or south based on that. Um, at night, no sun out, but there are the stars, and so the birds will know, they can tell which star is basically the north star. They can see where all of the stars are rotating around, and they'll use the star systems to navigate north. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide uh, because there's some interesting experiments proving that the birds are using the stars. Um, if it's really cloudy or foggy out, you can't see the light, you know, the sun directly, birds can use polarized lights, plain polarized light, where even if it's really cloudy, the angle of the sunlight hitting the clouds and hitting the atmosphere, it kind of not, it refracts essentially in different ways and it polarizes and you can tell where the sun is. And so even if the birds can't see the sun directly, this polarized light is something that birds can use um, to navigate. And then two newer ones that people are researching are infrasound and smell. And so infrasound is like these deep, loud sounds, the, the waves hitting a coastline from you know, tens or even hundreds of miles away, the strong wind over a mountain ridge. These are sounds that the birds might be able to use to know that the landmarks that they can't see yet are nearby and they can navigate with that. And then smell, 
you know, maybe birds can smell the salty air in the ocean. You know, if you're driving to the beach, you can smell the ocean before you can see it. And there's good evidence that the birds are detecting that as well. So here, there's a really cool experiment um, that has, that's been done to kind of prove um, and isolate what different senses birds are able to use to navigate. And so this little contraption here is called an Emlin funnel. And the point is basically you have a little bird that wants to migrate. You know, they maybe they caught these birds in the springtime, the birds want to migrate. They put them in this little cage essentially with a paper funnel and a little screen on the top so they can't fly away and an ink pad at the bottom. So the bird's feet get all inky. And then when they want to go north, they kind of hop towards the north side of the cone and that leaves their little inky footprints on the cone. And so you can see like after you know a night where they wanted to fly, you can go and look at all your birds and all the cones and there's only ink kind of going towards the north. And that's showing that the birds want to get to the north. And so the craziest experiment with this was somebody put a bunch of these birds in these funnels in a planetarium, you know, all of the stars kind of projected on the ceiling and the birds tried to go north. And then for a different group of birds, what they did was they switched the stars around. They made it so it looks like the Southern hemisphere, you know, they made it so that the stars are rotating the wrong way and the birds, they don't have any other cues to go off of, you know, they can't see the sun. Um, they're indoors, they probably can't smell the outside. And so they start kind of changing where they want to go based on the stars that are projected above in this planetarium. And so that was kind of really interesting proof that if you could fake it looking like the fall, just in the stars, the birds all of a sudden will go the wrong direction. Okay, so now we understand a little bit about the science behind migration. Let's look at some of the players in our story. So we'll start in the springtime and then we'll work our way kind of around through summer till fall and winter. Um, so here in spring migration, some of the big players are, like I mentioned, the insectivores, little birds that like to eat the bugs. Um, and so they are moving from South America up through Florida to um, Northern US and Canada. So things that we see in Florida during spring migration be things like vireos, and uh, warblers here. So we've got red-eyed vireo and blue-headed vireo on the left. Uh, we've got bay-breasted and chestnut-sided warblers here on the right. Um, and then another group of birds that we really only see during migration, we've got bobolinks, orioles, flycatchers, and thrushes. So these are all birds that really like to eat bugs. And so that's kind of the main reason they are heading north um, during the summertime. So on the other hand, there are many raptors um, that don't need to wait for summertime um, to kind of get enough food to nest. Uh, their large young may take a long time to mature. And so they need to start nesting earlier than everybody else to make sure that everybody fledges before fall. And so in central Florida, the most common of the early nesters are the red-shouldered hawks and the great horned owls, uh, which regularly have already laid eggs by February and have chicks in March and April. Uh, so these red-shouldered hawks here, they've got their little chicks in March. Uh, these guys were very kind. They decided to nest in the parking lot of my apartment. And so you could kind of monitor their nest right from outside my apartment. Um, so that was really awesome. Uh, very lucky to have that. Uh, but then great horned owls, the other early nesters that you might see in central Florida. Uh, here's a great horned owl chick blending in with the Spanish moss. Um, I took this picture last March 11th, which was before many of the migrant songbirds had even come through Florida. And here this chick is almost ready to fledge um, before a lot of the little warblers and vireos have even made their journey to their breeding grounds. So after spring, we get to the summertime. There are about 200 species of birds that breed in Florida regularly, um, including, as we've mentioned, the swallowtailed kite. Um, but some birds go that extra mile and they add some elaborate plumage and dancing to the standard singing and nest building. Um, so there are rookeries of wading birds in central Florida that are an excellent place to go and witness a whole array of really interesting behaviors like this great egret 
that is um, dancing with his big, crazy, elaborate plumes, um, trying to get his um, a female to come to his nest. So one such rookery that anybody who's near Whedon Island or Central Florida can go check out. Um, it's only about a half hour drive from Whedon, traffic on the causeway permitting. <laughs> um, but this is the North Lakes Wood Stork Colony. Um, and it's right on the side of this road. Um, and, you know, there's no hours or entrance fees or anything. And if you go there early spring all the way through summer, it is just packed to capacity with hundreds of large wading birds. Um, it's got wood storks and egrets and herons. Um, cormorants and anhingas, and I highly recommend visiting if you haven't gone there. Just pick a nice afternoon. Uh, the lighting is best in the afternoon. Um, otherwise, you're going to be staring directly into the sun uh, in March, April, or May, and you'll be greeted by just this raucous group of egrets, storks, herons, uh, all at some stage of nest building, courtship, dancing, and raising chicks. Uh, it's very fun to spend some time there. So when most people think about nesting birds, their mind probably goes to something like this. This is kind of the standard songbird nest, built of sticks, hidden in a bush, with these awkwardly adorable little chicks begging for food. So this is how nestlings look for many birds, but not all. Uh, so this sort of style of chick is called attritial. The babies are more or less helpless, relying on both their, uh, one or both of their parents for food and protection. So these here are mockingbirds. Um, and like most other songbirds, they have attritial young. Um, some birds, however, are precocial. They can walk and forage very quickly after hatching. Um, these sorts of birds often hatch or often nest on the ground, and so the chicks need to be able to move quickly to avoid predation, uh, something like the sandhill crane. So this little fluff ball here, this is a least bittern chick. And it kind of has a mixed strategy. It's incredibly well hidden with a nest woven in grasses and cattails, just like hovering over the water. But if a predator does happen to find the nest, the young are pretty able to scramble out and disappear into the reeds. And then they kind of lay low until the threat has passed and then they can return to the nest. Um, so they are probably, it's technically uh, pretty precocial, uh, but it is kind of an interesting mixed strategy here. Uh, one more standard nest, probably one of the most common nests that you'll see around Florida, especially around any ponds or swamps, is the red-winged blackbird. You know, it's a pretty standard little cup nest. It's got some little babies sticking their little heads up right there in the dark. Um, and so you can see them pretty readily in the springtime. So I do want to highlight one species that nests here in Florida, just because the way it avoids predation is so cool. And so this is the common nighthawk. Uh, it is most often seen flying around at dusk and dawn, catching insects in midair. And here's a baby nighthawk, adorable, apparently defenseless, just a little fluff ball. Uh, the parents don't waste any time or energy building a nest. They just lay an egg right on the ground, right on the open forest that you see here. Uh, so how do these guys not succumb to predators? I mean, this thing is just a chicken nugget sitting in the middle of the woods. So the first way that they avoid predation is camouflage. The eggs, the adults, and the babies, they're all very well camouflaged if they're just sitting still. And so this young one here, um, very quickly, they don't have, you know, they look fluffy a little bit at first, but very early on, just a few weeks, um, they'll get this nice camouflage plumage. And if they sit still with their eyes closed and they're not moving, not making a peep, it is very difficult to detect them. Uh, the second me uh, measure of defense here is the adults, the parents, if there's a predator getting too close to their nest, the parents will pretend to have a broken wing. They'll flop around on the ground and on low branches, and they'll look like they're sick or injured. And the predator will then look at the parents and be like, oh, well, there's a nice big meal that's injured and can't fly away. That seems like, you know, easy pickings right there. Let's go for them. And so they kind of flop farther and farther away from the nest. And then eventually they'll fly in a big circle back towards the nest. And the baby will probably have moved a little bit. And with that camouflage, it'll be very difficult for the predator to re-find that baby. Uh, so that's kind of a really interesting method um, that these guys use to 
uh, defend against predation. Uh, it's also something that killdeer and some plovers use if you get too close to their nests. Um, so here's a quick little video that I will share. Um, so just as a preface, in this video, you will see my hand close to this bird. I definitely don't condone harassing birds at all. What happened here was this little baby nighthawk was right in the middle of this path that I was on. And that's the only way I would have found it. It was perfectly camouflaged, but it was right in the path. And it's a path that was frequented by bikers and hikers. And I really didn't want this guy to get stepped on or injured. And so I was hoping to just kind of nudge it away from the path, but I got a little bit of a surprise when I tried to do that. Uh, so here, let's play this real quick. So this guy, So that little helpless looking baby nighthawk, it spread out its wings to look big and scary. It's got these white spots on its um, on the front of its wings here, just to kind of keep the predator's eye away from the baby's head. You know, the body itself is perfectly camouflaged still. You can really only see the wingtips. And then when I got too close to it, it hissed and it jumped at me, which honestly scared me quite a bit. Um, and I think that's kind of the point. If I was a coyote or a fox and I wanted to eat one of these guys, and it looked like, you know, just a little easy meal. And then all of a sudden it started jumping at my face and hissing. And then it kind of scuffled back away into the bushes. I might think twice about trying to actually eat that guy. <laughs> Oops. There we go. Oh, there we go. So after the breeding season comes fall migration. Um, and so here are a number of dowagers type of uh, shorebird. Uh, there's something that we would see a lot during fall migration. Um, so we have a lot of the same players as during spring migration, but there are often more dense flocks of shorebirds um, in the fall moving down the coast. I think one of the reasons you see that is um, that Florida is this peninsula and it kind of is funneling birds down it. So if there are birds following the coast, trying to migrate down through the Caribbean, down through South America, I feel like it makes sense that there would be more birds funneling through it in the fall when they're coming from the north, whereas in the spring, they might be flying directly over the Gulf of Mexico. Some of them might be missing Florida entirely. Um, and so I think you get more shorebirds in Florida in the fall for that reason. And so here, uh, these are some of the common species you could expect to see on the coast in Florida, um, maybe at Honeymoon Island or the Gandhi Causeway near Whedon Island. Um, so we've got things like leaf sandpiper, semi-palmated sandpiper, dunlin, semi-palmated plover. These are all common shorebirds that you guys can go see. And then again, you got many of the songbirds coming through on their journey back down to South America. But this time, many of them look different. So here on the left, you've got two species of warblers. You've got the black-throated blue, and you've got the black burnian. And then on the right, you've got those same two species. This top one, it's a black-throated blue warbler just in the fall. Same thing goes for the black burnian. This is a male black burnian warbler just in the fall. And so um, it's amazing how different they can look. They have lost all of their nice breeding colors because they don't need to impress a mate anymore. And they want to look more camouflaged. But it can be very difficult, very tricky to identify some birds uh, that are flying through in the fall because these guys look very, very different than their spring counterparts. So why do some of them look so different? Uh, especially the colorful ones like warblers. They've got these two different plumages each year. So in the fall and winter, the brown and streaky stuff, like we mentioned, but then in the spring and summer, they're nice handsome patterns. So birds, basically they need to molt. And so if it's not, the if the color is not there for breeding purposes to attract a mate, it could be there for camouflage, um, or it could just be kind of an, in so let me back up. You've got the colors that could be for breeding um, like these guys here. And so they'll change between these plumages every year. So it doesn't matter what age they are. A male yellow rumped warbler will look like the left image in the spring and summer, the right image in the fall and winter. But some birds, they molt um, just based on their age. So here's a little blue heron. Again, one of the most common birds in Florida. The top left here, they start out in 
pure white plumage. And then they go through this cool ghostly white and blue sort of mottled look as they're molting into their adult maroon and blue plumage here. And so adults here can look very different than the young for some species. Uh, gulls are some of the birds that have the most complex patterns of molt as they age, making them really difficult to properly ID. Um, even, you know, there's a lot of different species of gulls that look similar and it's further compounded by the fact that in their first year, there'll be this dark brown. And then in the second year, maybe they get a little bit of gray and white. And then they look kind of patchy, kind of like the adults, but look, even the beaks and the feet color change. And so it, for gulls, it can take three or four years before they look like their nice, clean adult plumage it can make it really tough to ID them. On the other hand, owls, uh, they look the same year round and whether they're male or female. So this great horned owl picture, just from the picture, you can't tell whether it's a male or female and you can't tell whether it's summer or winter. Birds can't molt all at once like this grasshopper here where they just shed their whole skin because birds need to be able to fly um, even when they're replacing their feathers. Um, so they often will molt their flight feathers like on their wings and tails sequentially. Uh, so maybe they'll molt, you know, out from the tip of the wing and then they'll molt down or they'll do kind of the reverse. Um, but in general, you'll see birds with one or two wing feathers molting at the same time, but not all of them because then they'd be stuck on the ground. Um, but if you can think of any birds that don't need to fly, there is an interesting exception, penguins. Uh, penguins go through something called a catastrophic molt. Essentially, they shed all of their old feathers at once. Uh, before kind of growing into their new set of feathers. And they look really scruffy for about a week or two. And they've been aptly and adorably described as exploding pillows during this process. So after the fall, we've got our wintering birds. Here we are back to winter, back to, you know, what birds you might see outside nowadays. We've got a few species of warblers, the palm warblers, especially they hang around um, all winter. Uh, and then you've got things like ducks, mergansers, um, things that want that open water to be able to hunt on, and then the white pelicans. And they're all the way back down here from the Midwest and the Rockies. So see, these are some of the birds that you can get here in the winter that you wouldn't get here in the summer. So there are some local spots you can go birding. These are some of my favorites. Um, you know, we've got Brooker Creek for some good swampy and foresty type birds, the wood stork nesting colony. Um, that I mentioned before. Definitely check that one out. If you haven't been to a rookery, uh, you can see a lot of fun stuff there. Lettuce Lake, um, Golden Aster Scrub down here. It's a little scrub preserve. It's kind of the only real good scrub habitat left within an hour's drive or so. And last I checked, there was still a family of Florida scrub jays that live there, and you can often find them there. So that's a cool place to check out. And of course, you've got Whedon Island and Honeymoon Island, which both have great access to some coastal uh, habitat, some mangroves. Um, and specifically for Whedon Island, the mangroves and the shallow lagoons are a really great place to see wading birds. Um, so here's a wood stork that you can see. Uh, and at low tide, if you can time it right and you go out to those little boardwalk overlooks, you can often see just large numbers of herons and sandpipers um, kind of foraging around in the mud flats in the shallow water. And then of course, my favorites, uh, the roseate spoonbills. Uh, these guys are also seen foraging uh, around the mangroves at Whedon Island. And of course, the osprey as well. They're always around, one of the most common birds anywhere there's water, um, especially in Florida. And you can kind of watch them for a while and you'll often see them hunting fish off the surface of the water. Uh, they're very good hunters. So as a bit of a recap here, Throughout a given year, uh, there's about 500 species of birds that can be found in Florida, but you can't see them all in one place or within one month. Um, many birds escape the cold of Northern states and Canada by visiting here in the winter time. Think of the ducks. Um, but again, some birds only spend the summer here to nest and then they head even further south to Central and South America for the winter, like the swallowtailed kites. Um, so there's multiple reasons that animals would migrate, and then there's many different sensory mechanisms that allow them to navigate ac accurately. 
Again, birds must molt their feathers regularly, which causes some species to undergo drastic changes in appearance as they age or in different seasons. And with that, we've come towards the end. And so I will definitely take any questions or comments people might have. I can go back to slides as well if anybody needs to see slides again. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Okay, so that was great. And we did have some questions coming in on the chat through your program. So let me bring those up right now and we can address that. Okay. Um, so early on, I think this is before you address the specific topic, but somebody did ask, why do only some birds migrate? Do you want to do a quick recap of that? Sure. Um, so there's definitely a couple of reasons. Um, I would say the main one would be food. Um, you know, so a lot of the birds that don't migrate are things like the wading birds, the herons, the egrets, they're there year round. Um, and that's definitely because Florida just has an abundance of fish and other sort of aquatic prey to eat year round. Um, and so you, got, you don't get those ones uh, flying, flying away because they've got plenty of food here, they don't need to move. Um, again, things like raptors and owls, uh, they often will sit still because they're hunting larger prey. They don't necessarily need the bugs as much. Owls will be hunting things like mice and voles and they're here year round as well. Um, so I think food is kind of the big one. But then there's also space, just territories. Birds need physical places to nest. Um, you know, some birds are pretty simple. They have pretty simple needs and they don't really, you know, they're not very specialized and they can just nest right on the ground. Um, but there are some birds that, you know, they need a special, like a cavity nest. You know, some birds only nest in a cavity that a woodpecker has made. And so the number of good cavities around might limit the number of birds that can be breeding in an area. And so they might need to keep moving on or disperse out uh, to find uh, good, suitable breeding habitat. Okay, thank you. And the next question, is there a site where we can see the daily migration of birds? Yes, I would say the first place I would go would be eBird. Um, so with eBird, you can look at recent checklists and sightings and you can see what birds have been seen nearby. And I'd say that's the best way to, to go about it because there you can look at a location and see what birds have been seen there, or you can look up a species of bird and get all the locations where that bird has been seen. Um, and so eBird is definitely the first place I go to if I have any questions about what birds are nearby and where they are. Um, and eBird has, um, is also kind of, they are the ones that make those flame charts that kind of show where the birds are. They've got a lot of great ways to visualize the data. Uh, so ebird.org is, that would be the go-to place. Okay, awesome. And the great horned owl chick that you had a picture of early on, uh, somebody was curious, was that taken at Philippi Park? Yes. <laughs> oh, that's yep. funny. Yeah, so that was like right in the parking lot. They had the caution tape, you know, all around so that people wouldn't get too close to the nest. But yeah, that was a very photogenic little owl. I love the the Spanish moss camouflage that it had there. Nice. And I know you can often see great horned owls also at Honeymoon Island, depending on the time of year. Yeah, Honeymoon Island, definitely. There's, uh, there's some nests out there. Um, yeah, there's a few places. I mean, the, the great horned owl picture, not the chick, but the adult, that one was also just right behind my apartment in Tampa. Um, Lucky. Uh, so they're, they don't need, you know, pristine wild places. They can be in the suburbs too. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then there was a question about the rookery that you mentioned a few times. Um, could you just reiterate where that was? Sure. It's called the North Lakes uh, Wood Stork Nesting Colony. It's off the Dale Mabry Highway, uh, like right in central, like right in Tampa, honestly. It's near, there's a high school uh, near there, North Lakes High School, I think. Um, but yeah, if you go into Google Maps and you look up North Lakes, one word, North Lakes, Woodstork, it'll fill in the rest and it should be able to find that. It's next to, I think it's on, is it Foxfire Drive? There's a little road there. Um, but yeah, if you find that near Dale Mabry, uh, near the Dale Mabry Highway, I know that's long, so it's not, it's kind of vague. But <laughs> um, yeah, that's definitely a good one to, to look for. And I guess also you could find it by going into eBird. 
and then looking for mm-hmm. sightings of, you know, like things like wood storks or something, and that'll definitely pop up as a hotspot. Okay, cool. I'll have to check that out too. Um, okay, and then we had somebody who made the comment that it's a good idea to remind birders and or photographers of the ethical practices when observing wildlife. And I was wondering if you have any advice or best practices that you would share with people who are maybe getting into photography or who are getting into birding that would ensure that they're having safe and ethical interactions with birds. Yeah, that's definitely always a good point to bring up. Um, Especially it comes up with owls a lot because people love owls and they're so photogenic. Um, And, you know, owls are roosting during the day. They don't want to be disturbed during the day. They're just trying to hang out there and not get mobbed by small birds. And so you kind of want to stay back a bit from owls. Um, In general, I would say you don't want to approach so close that you're affecting their behavior. You know, if birds start moving away from you, you know, don't follow them too much. You definitely, you're not going to get a really great picture if a bird's running away from you anyway. You'll get their butt, you'll get them all angry, you know, they'll fly away. Um, So I would say the big one would be don't be approaching so closely that they're obviously changing their behavior. Um, You know, don't be handling the birds or interacting. Um, You know, I Definitely the, the baby nighthawk is obviously the one that's kind of the borderline of, you know, my own actions, but I feel like, you know, it was right in the trail and I really didn't want this thing to get squished. There's no way somebody's going to see it before they jog by or bike by. And so I really just wanted to nudge it out of the trail into the bushes and in doing so, I was able to get a few pictures and things like that. Um, and I went back, you know, again, a week later and it was still alive and okay. So, you know, I think uh, giving them some space, make sure they're not changing their behavior, but then also doing your research beforehand, knowing how the birds are supposed to be acting, you know? So if you know what bird, you know, is spo- what this bird's supposed to be doing during the day, if it's actively feeding um, and you're taking pictures and it doesn't care and it's still feeding, that's, that's probably okay. Um, if it's feeding and then you get too close for a picture and then it's looking alert and kind of backing away, then you've kind of interrupted its feeding time. So maybe it's time to back up a bit. Um, So definitely, you know, don't want to handle anything. Um, And that definitely, honestly, it even goes more so for things other than birds, things like snakes. Definitely don't want to be touching snakes if you don't know exactly what you're looking at. And even if you know what you're looking at, it's best if you leave that to people with a lot of experience. (laughs) Yes, we agree. Thank you for making those points. Um, And I think they do apply to birds. They really apply to all animals. And it is really smart what you said that do your research and know something about the animal before you go out there and try to be observing it. Um, Because it is really easy sometimes to misread signals. I've seen birds that are displaying stress responses and people wouldn't know that because it looks different. And to us, it might just look like they're doing something funny, but they're actually disturbed and they would prefer we back off. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, like, like I said, with different behaviors that they're giving, if, you know, if a bird's doing a really cool behavior, it's feeding or doing courtship or something, getting too close is just going to change their behavior. You're not going to get as good of a picture anyway, you know, so mm-hmm. might as well stay farther back. And, you know, I kind of, I'm a big fan of trying to get the habitat shot where the bird's a little small in the frame and you got some habitat to show the context. And so if you find yourself not being able to get close enough without disturbing the bird, try and make that sort of a picture instead. <laughs> I like that. Good advice. Okay, so now I'm going to be moving into a lot of questions came into the chat while we were talking. And the first one is in the planetarium experiment, how was magnetic geolocation removed as a variable? So that's a good point. That might have been, I'm not sure if that one was a confounding variable Um, in that exact study. I would have to look up the study and see how they affected that. But what's interesting is that one of my best friends that was one of my roommates in college is actually doing that exact thing for his PhD right now. And he's making a giant magnetic coil box where you can put a bird inside and change the magnetic fields and see which way the bird wants to go when you change the magnetic fields. Um, And so, yes, it is definitely possible that the uh, magnetic fields were affected a bit. Though actually, now that I'm thinking about it, it, it it actually kind of proves against the magnetic fields thing because the magnetic fields aren't changing. North is still north, but when you change the stars, the birds are f- trying to fly in the wrong direction. They're trying to fly with, you know, what they think looks like 
you know, if the sky is rotating around a star, they assume, you know, that's the North Star, essentially. Um, so if you make the sky rotate around a different point, they'll fly towards that. And so that's, you know, without the magnetic field changing, they are altering their behavior. So that kind of shows that maybe they use the stars more so, they rely on that more so than they rely on the magnetic fields. So there's probably a hierarchy. Maybe they, mm -hmm. they use landscape, you know, landmarks first, they know, they trust what they can see, and then they use the sun and stars, and then they use smell. You know, maybe that's like a last resort. They only use smell if you blindfold them and, you know, ship them off somewhere else. Um, yeah, so that definitely, they d I don't think they controlled the magnetic fields in that experiment particularly, but people are doing it. <laughs> it's just difficult. That's interesting, <laughs> yeah. And hopefully if we have you back again in the future, you might know more about your friend's research and what those findings were. That'd be cool hopefully to hear. he will too. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah. Okay, um, the next question, somebody was asking, could you play the video of the baby bird again? I think they're referring to the night hawk or night char. Yeah. yeah, sure, here it's a little bit fun, there we go. Okay, so yeah, so here, so yeah, a night hawk is a type of night jar, same family as the Chuck Wills widows and whippoorwills. He's laying out on the ground, jumping, and hissing, trying to look big, trying to look scary and intimidating, definitely very startling. Um, but you know, you can see his back is still so camouflaged. You can barely see him against the ground. All you see is the wingtips. So if you know, a predator were to you know, dive at him and bite a wingtip, you know, that would hurt, but that's not nearly as bad as a predator grabbing him by the head or body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was very difficult to get him to move off of the path, honestly, because he kept <laughs> attacking so, so vigorously. That's a really neat video. I don't think I got to fully see that the first time around. <laughs> yeah, it was okay. an interesting experience. <laughs> um, the next question was, what was the name of the little black something warbler that gets all the yellow on it. One used to sleep on my porch, he says, he or she says. Nice. Um, so the one that has the yellow, this, probably this guy, this guy gets some yellow um, and you can confirm or not. So this is a yellow rumped warbler um, and you'll see them a lot up in New England and Canada in the summer in this plumage. And then if it's a different warbler, black throated blue, black Bernian, I guess a lot of them have black in their name. <laughs> um, so these are all different types of warblers. And the warblers are really fun because they're so colorful, but there's so many species. There's, you know, 40, 40 odd species of warblers in the US. Um, and when you're up north and you get a really good day of migration, you know, if you're up in New York or somewhere in May, you can get 20 species, 25 species of warblers in one day. And it's just all the colors, all the colors. <laughs> That's awesome. And I do feel for this person saying the little black something warbler because I know I struggle to remember their names and I do the same thing where I, I've got half the name, but the other half escapes me. Yeah, that it really, there are a lot of birds to keep track of, you know, there's 10,000 bird species out there. Uh, so there's a lot to, to keep track of. Um, and it takes some time, but it's, you know, it, it's kind of a, it's a steep learning curve where there's a lot to learn all at once, mm -hmm. but pretty much no matter where you go, almost everywhere except maybe, you know, the North Pole and South Pole, there's about 500 species of birds that are anywhere, you know, any state, any country, there's almost always about 500. And in any given season, there's always about 100 bird species that you can see, you know, mm -hmm. so it really kind of pairs down the immense amount of, you know, stuff you have to learn if you realize, okay, there's only really 100 to learn for Florida in the winter. And let's learn those ones, you know. That's true. And uh, I have used that before in the past when I see something that maybe I don't recognize. I'm like, okay, but what should be here at this time of year? And that really does help. Yeah. Okay. So the next question is, how long does it take to go from Florida to say Ohio for a bird? Um, that can be as little as a day or two. Um, they can move very far, very quickly. Um, Especially, you know, it depends on the winds a bit. If there's strong headwinds um, coming from the north and they're trying to fly north and there's rain and everything, they might land a few more places uh, along the way to stock up on food or something. Um, but yeah, if there's a strong tailwind, you can get birds just, f you know, flooding into the country and through states very quickly, um, moving hundreds and hundreds of miles a day. 
Um, and then some of the best uh, examples of this are the, the seabirds, things that make these incredibly long distance flights, uh, Arctic terns, um, dowitchers and godwits, things that go from the North Pole to the South Pole every single year. Just, it's incredible how far they go and how fast they can do it. Cool. And also kind of touching on migration, since we're already talking about that. Somebody asked, do morning doves migrate? I've noticed that there are very few in the fall and they seem to come back in January. Um, so I don't think, I don't think they generally do migrate. Uh, we can look, you can look at a range map and we can see maybe in some um, parts of their range they would. Um, so yeah, so they don't migrate most of their range uh, in Central and South America, they would be there only in the winter. And then up in places like Montana, Central Canada, they would only really be there in the summer. But yeah, through the lower 48, pretty much, they're year round. Um, but just because it doesn't migrate on this large scale doesn't mean that there's not small local populations moving around. And they might change food sources. They might change where they like to hang out. Um, so it's definitely possible that um, you know, you see morning doves in your yard for some months, and then sometimes they're not there. Maybe they like to nest there, um, and then they like to go somewhere else when they're not nesting, or vice versa. Um, that's something you see a lot with spoonbills. I feel like they're pretty nomadic. It can sometimes be tough to pin down exactly where to go to see spoonbills, but then all of a sudden there's a heavy rain, and all there's like those little tadpoles all over the place in the puddles, and then the spoonbills are just everywhere on, on lawns eating all the tadpoles. Yeah, that's actually really true. And we even see that at Wheaton Island. I know during the summer we get a lot of flooding and we have retention ponds that form. And then all of a sudden you will see lots of wading birds out in very accessible areas versus normally you'd have to be more so on our kayaking trail to see them, so. Yeah, and that's also for a place like Florida that has less of a distinct spring, summer, fall, winter, and maybe more of a wet season, dry season. You can see some, you know, populations of birds and other animals moving or changing their behavior with wet season versus dry season. That's a good point. Um, also talking about migration, does a certain density of backyard bird feeders affect migration patterns? I, so I think there's definitely some mixed research on this. I think that large scale, it probably doesn't affect it too much. There's probably not too much of a problem with that especially in Florida where it's not, it doesn't get so cold that there's not gonna be food anyway. Um, so what I mean there is if you're up in New England and you have lots and lots of feeders out that might keep birds around maybe a little longer than they should. And then there's a cold snap and that might be problematic for some birds that were supposed to migrate. Um, or, you know, it could be problematic, but you could also see it as they were stuck here anyway and I'm giving them food. So it's tough to know whether you're helping birds that were gonna stay anyway, or whether you're enticing them to stay where they shouldn't be. Um, I would say that unless you have tons and tons and tons of feeders and heaters and like, like oh, you know, you're really changing the landscape. I really don't see it as being that much of a problem. Um, the real problem would be if you have a bunch of feeders and then you also have a bunch of house cats that you let out in the yard at the same time. And then, <laughs> you know, then you're just attracting birds to their doom, you know, try not to have ha cats be outside. That, that's true. And that's actually a, an entirely different discussion about outdoor cats versus uh, indoor and the safety of our wildlife. Yeah. Um, okay, so somebody also asked, have you ever used birdcast.info? I have, I have looked at birdcast. Um, I, I honestly haven't used it much. Um, I have moved a lot more away from straight birding and more towards the photography side of it, I will say. So I uh, rarely will go out just with the purpose of seeing what birds are around. Um, I'll often, I'll almost always have my camera in hand and I'm hoping to see either species that I haven't seen before or get good pictures of ones that I have. Um, and so I honestly am doing less and less where I just am trying to target a specific bird just to see it or to keep track of what birds are in the area. Um, and, you know, it's, it's definitely, BirdCast is definitely good. I have used it. Um, so, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and that looks to be all of the questions we've currently received. Um, 
If anybody has any others, please feel free to add them into the chat now. And Brian, I just wanted to say thank you so much for today's presentation. It was really informative and a lot of fun. I loved some of your descriptions of uh, the little fluffy chicks like chicken nuggets yeah. <laughs> and the catastrophic uh, molting. I'd never heard of that before, but man, that is a wonderful phrase. Look up pictures of that. You won't be disappointed. <laughs> I am going to do that for sure. Funny. Yeah. And all, a lot of your photographs that were featured in the presentation were also really great. Um, do you wanna share with our attendees where they could follow along on your photography or view oh. more about it? Um, yeah, so I upload all my recent pictures up to uh, Flickr. Um, I know it's kind of an old school way to do it, but it keeps a high resolution picture. Instagram, you know, crops stuff and makes stuff small. And I don't know, I do Instagram a little bit, but uh, flickr.com slash Brian Magnier. So just me. Um, yeah, and I'll have a bunch of pictures up there. Um, just as I take them, I upload them. So most recent ones are snowshoe hairs, which you're not going to have in Florida, but they're around here. <laughs> Very cool. I will check that out. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning of the program, we do have a lot of other upcoming webinars. So if you like today's program, please follow us on Facebook or on Instagram. Our handle is Weedon Island Preserve. And you can also visit our website, www.weedandislandpreserve.org. And right there on the homepage, we have the list of all of our upcoming programs and we're often adding more programs. So please do follow us and reach out if you have any questions. So thank you everybody and thank you, Brian. Oh, thank you guys for having me. <laughs> Take care everybody.